Good morning. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. We're glad to have you with us here this morning. It's a jungle up here. Um, yeah. We're going to have a good time worshiping the Lord anyways. And we're glad you could make it out today. Let's all stand together as we prepare to worship the Lord together. And we're going to start with a good old song, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Praise my soul.
everything so that you and I could be saved. Amen. It's a wonderful reason to gather together to praise Him today. I want to invite you to, to bow your head with me, and uh, let's let's take a minute to pray as we continue on with our service today. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for the opportunity to be able to gather and worship you. And uh, Lord, you've given us a lot of reasons to be able to come and, and praise you today. And truly, you are worthy of our worship, our praise, and uh, the fact that you came and died for us. You were buried. You rose again. You've given us life. You've given us hope. You've given us purpose. You've given us a reason to sing. And you've given us your word to be able to uh, give instruction and help for these days that we live in today. And Lord, as we open your word in a moment, as we continue in your worship today, I pray you just be glorified in everything that's said and done. <coughs> Lord, we're not here to um, exalt ourselves, to exalt a man. We're here to exalt our Savior. We're here to exalt you. And I pray you'd be the focus of everything that takes place. And as your word's open, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, Today may be the day when they come to truly know you and uh, trust in your finished work on their behalf. And for those of us that know you, I pray that we be strengthened in our faith today, encouraged in our faith, and so that we can go on with uh, what you've given us to do in this life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And welcome again to Lighthouse this morning. Glad to have you with us. And of course, I, I see so many of our church family here this morning, and a couple of guests as well. We're glad to have you. Always a privilege to have guests with us uh, here at Lighthouse. And if you are a guest, I want to welcome you in particular and let you know we have a gift we'd like to give to you. Uh, because of all the COVID stuff going on right now, we uh, aren't giving it out during the service. But after the service, if you stop at the, the desk that's in the foyer uh, in the lobby there, uh, we'll have, there'll be a lady standing there. We'll be glad to give that to you. Always love having guests with us. We'd love to get to know you better. I hope we will get to meet you after the service as well. And thank you for being with us at our church here today. And as you can tell, uh, we're having vacation Bible school still. Um, if you weren't here last week, uh, this this isn't normal decor for our church, okay? Um, especially if you're new. Uh, we have a, the, we're putting on the incredible race. We had the first week of BBS this last week. We had about 50 different kids who came. Uh, to that vacation Bible school. Church family did a great job. Um, thankful for being able to teach these kids God's truth. And praise the Lord, there were six young people who made the decision to trust Jesus as their Savior. That's the best part of the whole deal. And uh, so and we'll have week number two uh, starting uh, tomorrow night at si from 6 to 8.30 um, in the evening. And so we're really excited to be able to, to do this again. Excited or crazy? I don't know which one we are. But... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a second week of BBS. So if you do have some young ones who didn't get to come, or even if you had some that came last week and want to come again, uh, we're having that second week of BBS, and we still do have some space. Uh, we have to keep the attendance limited uh, to try to keep people, uh, keep all the kids uh, spaced out and all that kind of thing. Uh, but hopefully we don't have to turn anybody away uh, for vacation Bible school this year. Um, and so uh, pray for us this week as we're, as we're going through the second week of Vacation Bible School. I appreciate the participation of our church family and those of you who have been praying for us. It was a great first week. And excited to get into the second week here. But I'm going to ask the Lord Wilson to make his way up. He's going to give us a couple of announcements and make some offers. Services, so we'll know basically how many people are coming. At 8.45 or 10.45, you can do that online. For the kids, exciting times. Junior church has started up again for grades 4 through 6th grade. And they're meeting upstairs as we're here right now. And so if you'd like to go up, if you've got kids, you can take them up there. And you're ready. And that will be going on from now on, Lord willing. Small groups have moved to midweek. Uh, this week, my groups moved to Thursday, thanks to Vacation Bible School. Uh, other groups are meeting at different times, and you're more than welcome to join. If you haven't joined a small group, fill out a connection card. They're on the table in the back, turn it in, and uh, they'll get you lined up uh, with someone. Or you can register online and join to be a part of the group. Next Sunday on the 26th in the afternoon, we're going to go down to the Bradfield Bridge and have a river baptism again. Yeah. Have you ever been to the Doris River in the middle of the summer? It's cold. 
<laughs> There's no other way to put it. So uh, come enjoy, watch them shiver as they get their baptism and, and baptism, and uh, have a good time. We have a picnic afterwards, and that's next Sunday afternoon. Uh, VBS award service will be next Sunday at 1045 right here for both sir, both VBSs, okay? So you know some of the kids that were here, remind them about that for next week. Get them to come, bring their parents, we're going to hand out things. Uh, that's an exciting time. Uh, pastor was handing out rewards this week on Wednesday night. And boy, the kids were just going crazy over some of it. They gave away an electric scooter. What's the fun in that? You don't have to do any work. Uh, <laughs> All right, then a couple of retreats coming up October the 8th through the 10th up at Preston Butte, and that will cost us $300, and you can register for that and be prepared to go, and I'll tell you what, it's always good times, and uh, I don't know about you, me, I had to look up where Preston Butte was at, I heard, heard it used, the name used, but didn't know where it was at, found out it's up above Gunnison, and uh, it's very pretty. And so plan to go if you can. Gentlemen, if you'll come, at this time we'll take up the morning offering. Amen. Let these guys answer this <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Oh, you didn't hear that. He goes, every morning. Uh, Brother James, would you pray for us this morning? Amen. Well, as these gentlemen take up this offering, we're going to sing a song the Lord came on our hearts to sing uh, this week. It's a song called There Was Jesus. Uh, through all the things that go on in our life, I'm glad for many of us that there was someone in our life we can go back to and realize that Jesus was at work even when we didn't know he was. So I hope this song is a lesson to you.
Jesus showed up in your life, the place where you got saved. And, and truth be told, if we would be honest about the testimonies of our lives, he was there all along, whether he knew he was there or not. In the good times and the bad times, sometimes I enjoy just going around and sharing testimonies as God's people. Well, even, in, even in the bad, even in the times in our life that seem like they're the most difficult, he was there. He's still taking care of us. And certainly on the mountaintops, it's easy to acknowledge, acknowledge God in those moments. And I'm thankful. Thankful for what the Lord has done in my life. And that's something we can praise Him for. We're going to join together and sing one, one more song together this morning. I want to invite you to stand with me. And this song really communicates the truth we're going to be looking at from the scripture this morning. Calvary covers it all. It's a good old hymn. But I love this song. Let's sing together. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was a message that came to my heart. How Jesus the Lord for my sins did atone, and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with the sin.
I had a pastor friend, uh, his name is Steve Chapel. He texted me a picture of a little, uh, a little dog this week. And uh, was standing on his hind legs and had these scrawny little legs at the bottom. And then it had a chubby little belly sticking out. And it said every single uh, youth pastor in his 30s on it. I was going to be pastor wearing skinny jeans in his 30s, as he said. It was a good picture. And I said, thank you for sending me that. He said, yeah, I know you just turned 30, so I think I really saved you from a lot of heartache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I walked into the church this morning, and right over here, it was Miss Burma. She was sitting there. And wouldn't you know it, she had a big white clock. And I thought, oh boy, my sermons must be getting so long. The people, uh, there's no longer good enough just to point at the watch. They have to bring in a big white cloth. You know, to tell me how long the service. That's not why she brought it, but that's what I thought when I saw it. And uh, so anyways, Hebrews chapter number 10 in the scriptures here. Already had a great first service this morning and excited to be able to get into the truth. Uh, the Lord has for us from the scripture here this morning in Hebrews chapter number 10. And this has been such a blessing to me this past week. You know, we have been in a series in the book of Hebrews on Sunday nights um, for the past year and a half. And we normally preach this series on Sunday nights, but the Lord just strongly put it on my heart with this particular passage of Scripture for this week to bring the message from Hebrews this morning. We're going to take a break from our series in Genesis, and we're going to turn to the book of Hebrews here today. And for those of you who have not been able to be with us on Sunday night, first of all, I encourage you, you can go to the website. Or go to our YouTube channel, and many of the uh, sermons from Sunday nights are posted on there if you need to get caught up. Um, but I'm going to uh, give you a, a brief introduction for the book of Hebrews that will hopefully give some clarity uh, to the significance of the things we're going to be looking at from the scripture here together today. Throughout the book of Hebrews, it was a book that was written to Hebrew people, obviously, in the scripture. It was a letter that was written to them. And as you read through the book of Hebrews, there is one single predominant theme that continues to manifest itself over and over and over again. And that theme is this. Jesus is better. He's better than anything or anyone that we have ever known. If you turn into the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, the writer begins by demonstrating us how Jesus is better than the prophets and the angels. And then as you turn through chapters 2 through 6, you begin to see how Jesus is better than any man, especially for these Hebrew peoples, men like Moses and Joshua and Aaron. Jesus is better than them. Then as you turn to chapter 7, we begin to see how Jesus has a better priesthood, a priesthood that he serves uh, uh, for us on our behalf to secure to us our redemption. And as we've studied chapters 8 and 9 and now into chapter 10, we began to discover how his priesthood is so much better because he ministers on our behalf, uh, uh, on the basis of a better covenant, in a better sanctuary, and all because of a better sacrifice. And it is the superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we are going to see demonstrated for us on the pages of Scripture here in Hebrews chapter number 10. And let me just summarize by saying, hey, it doesn't get any better than Jesus. Amen. It just doesn't get any better than Jesus. And I'm thankful for what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Now, the entire book of Hebrews, I believe, has been building up to this climactic point here in Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll go so far as to say is everything else we learn is Hebrew. Learning Hebrews is insignificant if what we learn in Hebrews chapter 10 is not true. Yeah, I'll go so far as to say we might as well throw our Bibles out if what we learn in Hebrews chapter 10 isn't true. Because none of it's true if what we learn in Hebrews chapter 10 is not true. But it is indeed true. And, uh, and uh, the truth that we're going to see here in Hebrews 10 will change your life if you just get a hold of it. Allow the Holy Spirit to work on your heart today. And so what is so revolutionary? About what we learned in Hebrews chapter number 10. Well, let's look at a couple of verses here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. If you're with me, say amen. amen. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offered oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 
For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Will you read verse 14 out loud with me? Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Begin. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Jesus Christ has offered up, up himself, the Bible says here, as a once for all sacrifice that is so much better than what any religion or self-effort could ever afford to us. He died once, the Bible says, so that we could live eternally, so that we could live forever. Now, there's significance to what we discover here in Hebrews chapter 10 for us, both as, a, as believers and those who need to become believers in Jesus Christ. So much significant truth. Warren Wiersbe wrote on this passage of Scripture these words. He said, sin is man's greatest problem. No matter what kind of religion a man has, if it cannot deal with his sin, it is of no value whatsoever. A lot of people walking around today with a religion that can do nothing to save them, that can do nothing to give them any security that when they die, where they are going to go. It's like, as a wise preacher once shared this illustration, I'll share it with you again here. He shared this illustration, and he, and he said, Someone once liked humanity to a man who fell down a well. And as he fell down the well, he began to call out for help. And from the bottom of that well, there was a passerby, uh, who heard this man calling out from the bottom of that well, and he went over to the side of the well to ask him what he wanted. The man looked up and he said, to get out of course. And as he was standing there by that well, he said, I know just what to do. So he went and took a piece of paper, and he wrote down some things on a piece of paper, and he threw it down to the man in the well. The man picked it up off the ground and looked at it, and it said, ten ways to avoid falling in wells. <laughs> And that's exactly what religion, the law, is to us as believers. The law is ten ways uh, to avoid falling in a well after we've already fallen into the well. You know, it doesn't do us much good then. And yet so many people are trying to follow a religion that has no ability to save them from their sins. No ability to save them from their plight of their fallen state. Can I tell you the truth we're going to discover here today in Hebrews chapter 10? It does have the power to save you. And it does have the power, indeed, to transform your life. And uh, uh, it's transformed my life as I've studied this passage of Scripture. And by the way, I believe this truth has transformed the lives of many other individuals as well. There's an example. There was a young man um, who... His mother had gone away for the day on some business, and he was left alone at home, and so he decided that he was going to read one of the books from his family library. Now, he knew that his mom was a Christian. They knew there would no doubt be some sort of sermon tucked into the book that he read, but he thought at least there will be some interesting stories uh, now and then inside the book. So he began to read the book. And as he flipped through the pages of, of that book, there was a phrase that captivated his heart. He'd never heard it before. You know what the phrase was? The finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, he had grown up in a Christian home and, and no doubt gone to Sunday school and, and he knew a lot of terms and a lot of things about salvation, about how it was supposed to work, but he never heard the phrase, the finished work of Jesus Christ. And he began to wonder in his mind. No, I wonder why they said that. He began to think, why didn't they just say the saving work or the atoning work or the propitiatory work of Jesus Christ? See, he knew all the terms finished work of Jesus Christ. And just that instant, the Holy Spirit spoke to the heart of this young man, reminded him of the words that Jesus spoke as he hung from the cross. He said three words, it is finished. And in an instant, he realized that the work of salvation had already been complete. Jesus Christ had already done all that was necessary to save the souls of sinful men. And as he thought on that truth, as a young man, he began to think in his mind, well, if Jesus has already paid the debt for all the sins of the world, what is there left for me to do? And he knew it in that instant. And he got on his knees, and he prayed and trusted Jesus Christ as the Savior to save him from all of his sins. And he was saved on that day, and that young man was none other than J. Hudson Taylor, the founder of the, uh, the, the, inland, the China Inland Ministry. 
that has literally reached hundreds of thousands of people throughout the years in the, in the country of China. That's what I got saved here. In understanding the finished work of Jesus Christ. And can I say to you, when you truly grasp this truth, it will transform your life no less than it did J. Hudson Taylor. And I'll say you, some of you, uh, you might have a tendency to want to tune out the truth that we're going to unpack from Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. But I'm telling you, this is not just for those who don't know that they're saved. This is a truth that's for us who do think we know we're saved. And furthermore, for those of us who know that we're saved. The truth we're going to look at in the scripture still will transform your life if you will allow it to, even as a believer. So don't tune me out and think, well, this is a salvation message. This is for somebody else, not for me. Yes, it is a salvation message. Oh, but friend, the truth we discover here might be one that you have not fully understood. And so pay attention to what the Scripture has to say to us here today as we <coughs> dig into it here this morning. Because I'll say this to you. So many believers, they live with no security. They live with no confidence. They live with no victory in their spiritual life. The Hebrew believers that were being written to in this passage of Scripture in the, in the uh, epistle of Hebrews, these were uh, individuals that the Holy Spirit was inspiring the author to write to them, to challenge them, to leave off their old Jewish religion with all of its ceremony and animal sacrifices and to go on from that to something that was better. You know what was better? Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for us. And that's the same challenge we're going to receive as we look to what the Scripture has for us today. You see, the Lord wants to challenge us as American believers here today to go on from dead religion to serve the living God. That's what He wants to give to us from the Scripture here this morning. And this truth, oh, if you grasp it, it will transform your life this morning. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Here's why this is significant. Jesus, through his once for all sacrifice for our sins, has made it possible for you and I to be reunited in communion with our Father. He has made it possible for us not to know about God, but to know him. Personally, intimately, and have confidence in our relationship with Him. And I believe that's something God wants to give us out of this passage of Scripture. And so I ask you this morning, what makes the sacrifice of Jesus so much better than what religion and the old system has to offer? Why should the finished work of Jesus Christ be so significant to you in your life today? And how can this truth transform your life? Those are some questions we're going to be answering as we dig in here to Hebrews chapter 10. Before we do, I want, I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. Because I believe God has some important things He wants us to understand from the Scripture. And will you pray and ask God to speak to you as we dig into this passage of Scripture today? Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and thank you for the opportunity to open your word. And Lord, I know that this is the truth that you wanted for this morning. And I know it's deep, but Lord, it's wonderful. And I feel inadequate to communicate this truth. Lord, I pray that you give an attentiveness of heart and mind to the people that are gathered in this room. And I pray that you would give uh, me ability beyond my ability to be able to communicate your truth. And that you would communicate your truth uh, uh, through your messenger today. And use your word to penetrate our hearts and lives. Use it because it is alive and powerful. And uh, Lord, pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. I know, Lord. I believe the promise of your word, and I pray you work with power as we uh, labor to, 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 to give the scripture to your people today and bless our time together in the word. And Lord, if there's one that doesn't truly know they're saved, work on my heart. And for those of us that do know we're saved, Lord, let us believe what you said you've done for us is true and walk in light of it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, I want to give to you from Hebrews chapter 10. Three biblical reasons for why Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is so much better. Now write this down, number one, if you're taking notes. Number one, Jesus' sacrifice is so much better because it is what was required. Because it was required. You can write that down, number one. Because it was required. Now go back to verse number one in Hebrews 10. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. 
you got to put your thinking cap on this morning because we're diving into some deep and wonderful truth in the scripture. scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 1. If you're still with me, say amen. Amen. All right, we're, we're waking up a little bit here. All right, we're about to the level of a Protestant church now. Um, we'll get to a Baptist church eventually, I hope, this morning, okay? Uh, but number one, the Bible says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Here the Bible begins to outline for us what was first off required uh, from God, what made Jesus' sacrifice superior and so much better than all the other sacrifices of the Old Testament. The Bible here speaks in verse 1 of the law as a shadow of good things to come but not the very image of those things. And that word shadow in verse 1 speaks of a, a figure representing the form of something. Listen, we know what a shadow is. I don't think I need to labor to, to, to emphasize what a shadow is. We all carry a shadow behind us everywhere we go. And understand what a shadow is. But what is being emphasized in this passage of Scripture is that you really can't benefit from the shadow of something. For example... I can't carry on a conversation with my wife's shadow. Where's my wife? Oh, she's in the nursery. I can't, I can't uh, uh, take, take my wife's shadow out to dinner. Um, I can't kiss my wife's shadow. Or if I did, it wouldn't be very satisfying. <laughs> you can't benefit much from a shadow. Another, another offer that I read this week, he said this, the shadow of a key cannot unlock a prison door. The shadow of a meal cannot satisfy a hungry man. And even so, the shadow of Calvary cannot take away sin. Now don't miss this. The Bible says here in verse 1 that the law was nothing more than a shadow. It was an outline. It was a figurine of what was to come, but it wasn't anything like what the real deal was going to be like. And in stark contrast to the shadow here in verse 1, there's another word that's used. In verse 1, the Bible says, For the law was a shadow of good things to come, and not the very what? Image. Image. Now that Greek word for the word image is a, is a Greek word icon. You ever heard that word before? Well, the, the, that word actually talks about a true likeness. The law wasn't a true likeness of what was to come. Jesus was the true law, or the, the true likeness. He was the fulfillment of everything the prophecy of the Old Testament pointed to. And so what we discover here in the Scripture is that the law, the Old Testament law, all that offered was shadows. But Jesus Christ is the substance. He's the real deal. He's everything that we have needed as fallen people and so much more. And so here's the thing. Don't miss this. God never intended the system of the law to be the process whereby we would obtain our salvation. From the moment that God instituted the law all the way back on Mount Sinai, it was never given as a way for people to be saved from their sin. That is not from the very beginning the purpose for which God established it. But the Bible indicates that this law was just a shadow that was to draw our attention to the need for the Savior, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Now look in your notes if you have those with you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 22. The Bible says, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. Here's the thing. The law is our teacher, the Bible says. So when the law says thou shalt not lie and you lie, the law convinces you of something. You know what it, you know what it convinces you of? You're a liar. Well, that's not very nice. But why is that important? Because it's important that you understand you're a sinner. Why is that important? Well, it's important you understand you're a sinner so that you know that you need a Savior. That's why the law works in our hearts to bring us to the end of ourself and to the beginning of the realization that without Jesus Christ, we are all desperately lost and bound for punishment in hell and for all of eternity. That's what the law teaches us. 
That, that was God's intention for it from the very beginning. And so we begin to see this requirement expressed in the scripture. But it doesn't stop there. Look again at verse number one with me, if you would. The Bible says, for the law, at the end of the verse it says, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every single year. Hey, the Old Testament sacrifices of those animals on the altar, all it did was to serve as a continual uh, cause of guilt in the conscience of the people who offered them. And the reason why is because they would come and offer a sacrifice to atone, to get their sins forgiven. And as soon as they walked out the door of the tabernacle, they would sin again. And they know they need to go back. And they can never get away from the nagging feeling that they were always guilty. That there was always another offering that needed to be offered up. Always another sacrifice that needed to be given. It's kind of like a man who decides he wants to start a business. And so he goes to a bank to get a loan. And the bank agrees to loan the man the money for a year on the condition that there is a cosigner. Um, who will cover the amount of the loan if he can't pay it. So this man has a rich friend. The rich friend signs off that he'll pay the debt if the man can't pay it, and he goes off to start his business. And lo and behold, a year later, he comes back around, and the business didn't take off as well as he thought it was going to. And so he needs to come back to the bank again and get more money. And again, the bank agrees to lend him more money with the with the with the with the signature of this rich friend, assuring that he'll pay the debts if the man can't pay it himself. Now imagine this happening for several years. Every year, the man has to come back again. Every year, he has in his mind, "I'm not making enough money. I can't pay off this debt." And the day's coming when I'm going to have to walk back in that bank again and ask for more money. Every year. There is a remembrance. There is a reminder that his debt is not paid. Here's the interesting thing about it. All the while, there's a rich friend who signed his name that he paid the debt. And friend, for you and I, that rich friend who could pay the debt that you and I will never be able to pay is Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, this remembrance of sin. This continual living in guilt is not so dissimilar from a lot of religions nowadays, like the Mormons, like Jehovah's Witnesses, like the Catholic Church. Probably they're the most vivid in my mind when it comes to this. See, the Catholics think that in order to get forgiveness of sin, they need to go to a confessional. And in a confessional is sitting a priest, and they have to confess their sins regularly to this priest in hopes that maybe this priest can give them forgiveness with God. And no matter how good of a life they're living, there's always a continual reminder of their need to go to confession to get their sins forgiven. It's exactly what these Jewish believers were, Jewish, Jewish people were going through in this day and time with thinking that they needed to continue to offer up these sacrifices. And what the scripture is indicating to us here is that those people who live in such a state, they're never free. And that is not what Jesus Christ has came to provide for us as the people of God. Don't miss this. Hey, while the sacrifices of the law are just a continual reminder of our guilt, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is a continual reminder of God's grace. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 20 in your notes. Romans 5, verse 20. The Bible says, moreover, the law entered it, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, read the last part of the verse with me, grace did much more abound. I'm glad where sin abounded, the Bible says, grace did much more abound. When I'm looking to my own efforts, when I'm looking to religion to save me, I, I live in a continual place of guilt. But when I look to Jesus to save me, I'm not reminded of my guilt, but I'm reminded of God's grace that was sufficient to save even a soul like me. So here's my question for you this morning. When it comes to your faith, your religion, Whatever you want to call it. Do you find in it a continual reminder of your guilt? Or a continual reminder of God's grace? I don't know about you. 
And I'll gladly leave the religion behind that causes me to live in continual guilt. And I'll gladly receive the grace of God because only that can save a soul like mine. Amen. And that's what we begin to see in this passage of Scripture. You see, there's only one sacrifice that could have been sufficient to pay for uh, your sins and my sins. And it wasn't one that was given by the law, but it was one that was given by grace through Jesus Christ. And that's what we begin to see in this passage of Scripture. The Bible goes on to say in verse number 4, if you're still with me, say amen. 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 Now, if you say amen more often, I'll probably finish sooner. That, that makes the preacher want to go faster. You know that, right? You're like, we've been here long enough, we know that's not true. Okay. <laughs> well, verse number four. Anyways. Uh, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. The Bible says it's not possible that these animal sacrifices could take away sins. You see, all the sacrifices that the law could ever do was cover sins, was cover them up. Uh, and the Bible says, he that covered the sins shall not prosper. Uh, and all, all the sacrifices the law could do was cover sin. They could never do something that only Jesus' sacrifice could do. They could never completely take them away. They could never remove them with all their guilt and condemnation. And that's why the people of Israel had to continually offer up the sacrifices to stay up to date on their forgiveness. And by the way, hey, many Christians today live as if they do need to stay up to date on their forgiveness. Many a person lives their whole life wondering if they're really truly forgiven. Well, am I current for today with all my forgiveness? Have I confessed all my sins? Have I offered up enough sacrifices to be able to be forgiven for God and be able to go to heaven? There are a lot of people who claim to be believers that live this way as if they do need to continue to bring these sacrifices to the Lord. A man by the name of Newell, he wrote this, If it were told the average Christian, that Jesus in heaven will never put away another sin for you, it would strike him with real terror. For he has not rested in that once for all putting away of sin at the cross. What am I going to tell you? That after you're saved, Jesus will never forgive you for another sin. Can I tell you? I can tell you that. Because he already has forgiven you of all of your sins. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Amen. yet we want to live as believers thinking that it's up to us, that we still need to deal with all of these things that Jesus Christ has already dealt with through sacrifice on the cross. And so we see that Jesus' sacrifice is so much better because it was what was required to save us since we could never save ourselves by our law keeping, by our trying to do good and be good enough. But the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that it's by God's grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. His sacrifice is superior. Number one, because it was required. Number two, write this down, because it was resolved. It was resolved. Now, knowing what was required to atone for the sins of man, what we continue to see, starting in verse number 5, is that God resolved to send His Son to be the only sacrifice that could pay for our sins. Look at verse 5 with me. The Bible says, Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. The passage that is beginning to be quoted here in Hebrews chapter 10 comes from Psalm chapter number 40. And here, as in this place and in many other places, the psalmist David, he recognized something. That God had no pleasure in all of those animal sacrifices that were given in the Old Testament. Because they had no power to save eternally. They had no power to actually bring about the redemption of any soul. And he talks about how God had no pleasure in all of these things. And that's why God, in his great grace, he determined to do something for you and I that we never will deserve. And certainly, uh, uh, certainly uh, he didn't have to do. God resolved to send his own son to be the sacrifice for our sins that was sufficient to be able to save us from our sins and the judgment that we deserve. That's why the Bible says in 1 John chapter number 4 and verse 14 that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We call this truth the truth of the incarnation. 
when God sent Jesus in the flesh to come to this earth to save us from our sins. Hey, we celebrate Christmas, okay? We celebrate Christmas. We were reminded of the message that the angels gave to Joseph about this coming Messiah. The angels told Joseph he's going to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God came down from heaven to dwell among men in the body of Jesus Christ. Not only was he called Emmanuel, though, but his literal name that people called him while he walked around this earth was what? Jesus. The name that means Savior. The angel said, you will call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so the purpose for which God resolved to send his son into this world is very clear. It was to save us. Oh, but God wasn't the only one who resolved to send Jesus to come into this world. You see, Jesus resolved to come himself in this world. Knowing that there was no other way for us to be saved, Jesus stepped down from his throne in heaven, and he came down to this earth, and he became a man, and he offered up himself as a willing sacrifice to pay for your sins and for my sins. That's what Jesus did for us, and this is what he indicates in verse number 7. Look at verse 7 with me in your Bibles. He said, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. I'm here to tell you this morning, from before the beginning of time, before God created the first man, before God created this world, he had already predetermined that he was going to need to save us from our sin, that we would fall into sin and need to be saved for our, from our sin. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, before the world was even established. Jesus was already resolved to be willing to come and offer up himself as a sacrifice for our sins. That's why when Jesus came into this world, the Bible tells us in John chapter 4 and verse number 34 that Jesus said this. He said, my meat is to do the will of them that sent me and to finish his work. That's why when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, before he went to the cross to die for our sins, he got on his knees and he prayed to God, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. See, Jesus didn't come here to do what he wanted to do. He came here resolved to do what he needed to do to save our souls. And he sacrificed himself on the cross to die for our sins so that you and I could be saved. I'll tell you something. We didn't deserve that. We'll never deserve that. But God, the sinless Son of God, came in the flesh to offer up himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And so we see a joint resolution that was made on the part of God the Father and God the Son to come and save us from our sins. Now, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, it goes so far as to say that it pleased God to bruise Jesus. Do you think about that? It pleased God. That those nails were driven into his hands. It pleased God that he bore those stripes for our sins. It pleased God that that crown of thorns was put on the head of his only son. Why did it please God? Because it was by that sacrifice and only by that sacrifice that you and I can be saved. That's why it pleased God. And there's no greater demonstration of grace in this world than Jesus' sacrifice for us. That's why you oftentimes hear people define grace as God's riches at, at Christ's expense. You see, it didn't cost us anything to receive salvation. It cost Jesus everything. We get to go to heaven because he went to hell for us. Amen. That's what grace looks like. God giving us what we don't deserve and what we could never, never earn. You see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. No greater way was this on display than when Jesus hung on that cross. And to make matters 
even more abundant in seeing God's grace. Jesus died for people who were not his friends, but who were his enemies. He didn't die for people that loved him. He died for people that he loved, though. The Bible calls us enemies of God before we trust Christ as our Savior. We're doing our own thing. We're, a we're apostate, opposing God. And yet Jesus still came and died for us. I'm glad he resolved to do for me what I could never do on my own. Don't miss this. Religion wants to tell you, you can have the willpower to be good enough to be accepted by God. And if you'll go to church and you'll get baptized and you'll do all the sacraments and you'll do this and you'll do that, then you can go ahead. Whatever version of what they call heaven, whatever it is. That's what religion tries to tell you. That you can just get, you can be resolved enough to be good enough to be accepted by God. What we see in God's resolve here is that you and I can never be good enough. Right, right. And thank God that even though we can never have enough resolve to be accepted by God, God had enough resolve to come into this world and sacrifice himself for us so that we can be saved. Yeah. Why is this sacrifice superior? Why is it so much better? Because it was what was required to save us. Hey, because it was the resolve of God to come into this world to save us from our sins. Here's the final reason for why his sacrifice is so much better. And number three, you can write this down in your notes. Because it was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. You see, the finished work of Jesus Christ is revolutionary. When you truly get saved, that fact will transform and change your life for all of eternity. There is no more significant action that has taken place in this world in the ends of time than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no truth that can change a heart, change a life more quickly than coming to the realization that Christ died for your sins and that you can be forgiven and your life can be transformed. This truth will flip the script of your life if you will come into the realization of it. That's why the Bible says at the end of verse number 9, He taketh away the first, that He may establish the second. You see, Jesus came in this world to do away with the old system and to give us something new. And I'll add this, not just new, but better. <laughs> A whole lot better. I'll tell you what, I'm glad that we don't have to offer up animal sacrifices every week to get our sins covered. Hey, let's be honest. I'm really glad about that. Now, some of you, you've butchered those elk. You, you don't mind doing that because you get eaten, okay? But I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. I'm glad Jesus offered one sacrifice and it's a done deal. He's paid for our sins. And that truth is revolutionary. Let me give you a few of the results that uh, are evident in our life as believers from this passage of Scripture. <laughs> Because of Jesus' finished work. Number one, write this down right here. The Bible says, uh, because of Jesus' finished work, Jesus has consecrated us for his will. Write that down. Number one, Jesus has consecrated us for his will. Now don't lose me here at the end. This is just getting, this is just getting to be the best part right here. Verse number 10. The Bible says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. What the Bible begins to tell us here is that Jesus' Jesus's finished work on Calvary has secured for us a once for all sanctification. That phrase, once for all, at the end of verse 10, it is indicative and it emphasizes the finality of Jesus' work on our behalf. And the Bible tells us here that Jesus' finished work has provided to us a once-for-all sanctification. And that word sanctified in verse 10 is not a word that we use very much. You know what the word sanctified means? Well, it's talking about being set apart for a specific purpose. We, when the Bible uses big words like this, we get all confused sometimes. So let me give you an example of something that's sanctified. That pew you're sitting in is sanctified. You say, what? Why is it you sanctified? Did you sprinkle some holy water on it? No, there's no holy water to sprinkle. Um, no, it's not sanctified because of that. It's sanctified because it is something that we have designated to be used for corporate worship. It's set apart 
for a specific purpose. Can I tell you, when you got saved, God set you apart for a specific purpose. Yeah. To fulfill His will. That's what it means to be sanctified. That's what the Bible is communicating to us here in the Scripture. And so, you are holy, not because of what you do for God, but because of what Jesus has done and is continuing to do in you. Amen. We get this backwards a lot, don't we? We think it's up to us to be holy for God. When all the while, when we got saved, because of Jesus' blood, God set us apart for his purposes. And that's something that God does. And it's not something that we do. I am holy not because I'm a really good person. I am holy not because I go to church. I am holy not because I do this or that. I am declared as holy before God because when God looks at me, he sees the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes me holy. Yeah. That's what makes me set apart to God. I'm not worthy to be alone to the Lord. God would have nothing to do with me if it was in and of myself. But thank God I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And now when he looks at me, he calls me one of his own. He calls me his child. And that's because of what Jesus has done for me. That's what it means to be sanctified. And friend, because of Jesus' finished work here today, the Bible tells us that he's consecrated us. For his will. And what a wonderful and uh, liberating truth that is for us here today. We've got to move along. Number two, note this down. Another result of Jesus' finished work is this. Jesus has completed the work for us. He has completed the work for us. Now look at verse 11. Okay? Now, if you're still with me, say amen. Amen. Good. See, we're getting there. We're, we'll maybe be there at the end of the sermon, maybe. But verse 11, the Bible says, And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices. Read the last part of that verse with me. Which can, can never, never take, take away, away sins. sins. I asked this question earlier. Let's see if we get this one right as well. What's the definition of insanity? <laughs> It sounds pretty similar. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Can you imagine being these Old Testament priests? Having to offer up these same sacrifices. And another guy to offer another one. It's never going to be good enough. Now, I understand they did it by faith, because that's what God had commanded them to do during this Old Testament period. But boy, offering up the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. You see, the Old Testament priests had to continually be about their work of offering the sacrifices. And they never sat down so long as they were going about their ministry because the job was never done. Can you imagine doing something and never getting it done? Some of you are like, have you been to my house? <laughs> <laughs> but doing something and the job never being done, no hope really of it ever being done. One person wrote this, the ministry of the priest was never done and never different. It was the same thing over and over and over again. But in stark contrast to that, look at verse 12. The Bible says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And he goes on to say in verse 14, For by one, and that word one indicates only one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hey, after Jesus performed his high priestly ministry on our behalf by offering up himself as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross, there on the cross, he explained the phrase that we've come to uh, love dearly as the people of God. He said, to tell us, you know what it means? He said, it is finished. The work that was necessary to pay for our sins had been done. Jesus Christ's death on the cross was sufficient to pay for your sins and to pay for my sins. And the Bible tells us after he offered up that, sin, that great sacrifice, look at verse number 12 again. He said that this man, after he offered up one sacrifice for sins forever, read the end of the verse with me. It says he sat down on the right hand of God. Guess what? Those Old Testament priests, they're always on their feet. They're always ministering because their job's never done. But after Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, he ascended to heaven. And friend, I'm here to tell you today, he sat down because the job's done. 
our salvation is complete. Nothing more needs to be done for you to be saved other than you receiving it by faith. That's it. That's what Jesus has accomplished for us. And I'm so thankful for that truth right there. And so we see, number one, the first result that's revolutionary because of the finished work of Jesus Christ is that Jesus has consecrated us for his will. The second is that Jesus has completed the work for us. The third truth written down is this. Jesus has conquered the wicked forces over us. He has conquered the wicked forces over us. Friend, if you've been a little discouraged about all the nonsense going on in this day and time, you better listen up for just a minute to this point right here, because I think it will give you some encouragement. Look at verse number 13. The Bible tells us that after Jesus had sat down and finished the work of our redemption, in verse 13 it says that he sat down from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Till his enemies be made his footstool. Can I tell you, the redemptive work, the saving work of Jesus Christ, annihilated completely and totally all of his enemies. They thought when they put him on that cross, Satan thought, the forces of darkness thought, Herod thought, those wicked Jewish men who put him on the cross thought that they had won, that they had gotten rid of Jesus. That they thwarted the plan of God when they put him on a cross. But lo and behold, Jesus told them, before they even put him on the cross, this is your hour and the power of darkness. And after Jesus died on the cross, they put him in a grave. And for three days, the forces of darkness thought they had won. But then on the third day, up from the grave, he arose. And when he arose, he conquered sin and he conquered death. And I'm here to tell you today, I serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. And you ask me how we know I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. The fact of the matter is, when Jesus rose again, he overcame entirely the forces of darkness that exist in this world. They don't have a standing place. They don't got a chance. And I'm here to tell you today, hey, it's not a matter of if Jesus is going to conquer the works of the enemy. It's just a matter of when it's going to be brought to full realization. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 25, For he, Jesus, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I'm here to tell you today that there is still going to be a day when, as the scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You can go down through the ends of time, and I don't care who it was. I don't care what type of individual life they live. Uh, uh, there's going to come a time when every person in heaven and earth and in hell itself will stand before Jesus. Jesus Christ and bow the knee to acknowledge that he is Lord. Hey, I'll tell you this, Obama's going to say he is Lord. I'll tell you this, Oprah's going to say he is Lord. I'll tell you this, Hitler's going to say he is Lord, but so will you. Whether or not you want to acknowledge it on this side or not, every day we're going to stand before the God of creation, our Savior Jesus Christ, and acknowledge that he is Lord. Jesus wins. That's what we learn from the back of the book. Mm -hmm. He always wins. He's victorious because of what he accomplished for us on the cross. And so Jesus has conquered the wicked forces over us. Friend, it's easy to get discouraged in the times we live in with all the nonsense we see going on. Mm -hmm. But it's very encouraging to know I'm on the winning side. Amen. No matter what nonsense might happen down here, I know what happens in the end. Amen. And I know I'm on the right side. Here's the fourth truth. We've got to hasten. Number four, because of his finished work, Jesus has changed his working within us. He has changed his working within us. Look at verse number 15 with me. The Bible says, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he has said before, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law into their hearts and their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember or recall to mind no more. The author of Hebrews is quoting a prophecy from Jeremiah chapter 31 here. We're all the way in the days of the, the captivity of Israel. Jeremiah the prophet had written of a day that was going to come. 
when God would make it possible for us as men to be reunited in an intimate relationship with him. That we could truly know him and not have to have someone else tell us what God says, but we could know what God says for ourselves. Hey, not have to wonder if our sins are forgiven, but have the assurance from God himself that our sins and iniquities are remembered no more. What a wonderful thought that is. Can I tell you, the day the prophet prophesied of is now because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hey, Jesus has paid for all of your sins. He has made it possible for you to have a relationship with God himself through your faith in him. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He's the mediator between God and man, and he's the only one that can bring you back into a relationship with God. Jesus, because of what he's accomplished for us through his death, burial, and resurrection, and by the blood of Jesus Christ, he has now given us the ability, once again, to know God intimately. Hey, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off from God, are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we're brought into a renewed relationship with the Lord. And let me just add this in there real quick as a sidebar. Hey, uh, the fact is, <clears throat> the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit communicating this truth right here that we just read. In verse 15, it says, wherefore the Holy Ghost saith. You know, Jesus, after he saves us, he puts a part of himself inside of us, his spirit. We are indwelled by the Spirit of God. And God has put His Spirit inside of us to teach us the realities of the truth I'm talking about today. If you're sitting here today and some of these things seem like a foreign thing to you, it may be because God is not living within you. It may be because you've never truly put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 that the Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. To make that very simple, if you are God's, you will know it. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, there will be no doubt that you, are, that you belong to the Lord. The Spirit of God will make that clear to you. And so we see, hey, because of all of this, the Lord has changed how he works in our life. Hey, it used to be, before we come to faith in Christ, we think it's all up to us to do God's work. That's what religion teaches us. After we come to faith in Christ, we begin to realize that now it is God who does the work in me. See, religion, all performance-based. Christianity, as it is taught in the Scripture, is all dependence-based. It's not I, but Christ. Amen. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect and your weakness. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God that works in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. When you truly understand what Jesus has done for you, it sets you free from trying to have to always do something to get God's favor. Now you have it, and you're just free to live your life for the Lord. You're just free to live for the Lord. What a blessed thought it is. One final truth and we're done. Number five, revolutionary truth. Jesus has cleared the wages against us. Now help me out. Those of you that grew up in Sunday school, you should know. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. It says the wages of sin is what? Death. 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 The wages of sin, what we deserve for the wrong things we've done in our life is to die and suffer eternity in a place called hell, the Bible teaches us. But thank God, revolutionary truth, because of the finished work of Jesus, he has cleared the wages against us. Look at verse 18 and we'll be done. The Bible says, now where remission of these is, there is, read the last four words with me, no more offering for sin. No more offering for sin, where the remission of these things is. That word remission speaks of letting something go as if it had never been committed. And here's the thing, Jesus Christ, when you put your faith in him, he has made it possible for God to let go, to forgive you of all of the uh, 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 trespasses that he held against you, all the wrong things that you've done. God has let go of those things. He's forgiven you of those things because Jesus has already paid for them. 
And the Bible says that where remission of these things is, there is no more offering for sin. In other words, there is nothing further that needs to be done for you to be saved. I have people tell me all the time, well, Pastor, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't feel like I'm ready to make that decision yet. I've got to get some things cleaned up in my life first. You know, I, I've got to stop doing this and stop doing that. And I need to start going to church again. And, 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 and I need to really re re redo all of these things that I feel like I've messed up. And, and so many people feel like they've got to jump through all of these hoops before they can even ask God to save them. But that's the exact opposite of what the gospel teaches us. I remind you. You're in a well, and you can't get out of the well. And every religion will try to give you a list of things on how not to fall in that well. There's only one truth that can set you free, and the one truth that can set you free from that well you put yourself in, from those wages of sin, is Jesus Christ who walked down into the well, took you out of the well, and set you free. Amen. Through his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. See, the gospel is liberating. Religion is is kept, it, it, it puts you back into bondage. That's what it does. And, the, and the, this truth that we see communicated in this passage of Scripture is a truth that God wants to use to set us free. Anyway, Satan wants to use religion to keep you bound. He wants to use religion to make you live your life thinking, even as a believer, that God wants nothing to do with you. That you're in and out of God's favor. He wants to keep you from feeling like you can talk to God. You ever talk to somebody that says, well, you know what? Uh, I can't pray right now. I've got to get a bunch of things right in my life first. Completely sucks the confidence and boldness out of your life as a believer when you think that type of thing is true. See, the only way it's possible for the Bible and the book of Hebrews to go on to tell us that we can have boldness and confidence to enter into God's presence is if our problem of sin has been removed. Right. And when we understand what Jesus has done for us on the cross, and how his once-for-all offering has forever forgiven us of our transgressions, that sets us free to enjoy true intimacy with God. And that's the place that God desires to bring every single one of us. Oh, friend, when we think of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it really is so much better than what religion has to offer to us. So much better. So why would you go back to religion? Why would you go back to your self-effort when God has offered to us something so much better than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed here this morning. I say to you this morning, the best thing for you to do with this truth we've discovered from the scripture today is to just believe it. If you're sitting here today and you say, Pastor, I know there's been a day and time in my life when I put my trust in Jesus Christ. I know that I am saved. If that's you this morning, would you lift your hand as a testimony, Pastor? I know that I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I know that I'm saved. Many hands, you can put them back down. Would there be someone in here today that would say, Pastor... If I'm being honest, I don't know that I've ever truly accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've lived my whole life thinking that it was really up to me. And, uh, or that I, I couldn't truly know that I'm saved or forever be saved. But the day I've realized that Jesus has offered one offering to pay for my sins forever and today, I've realized I need to believe in what Jesus has done for me. I need to be saved from my sin. If that's you today, would you raise your hand? I don't want to call you out and embarrass you. I see that hand. Anybody else would say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that my sins are forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. Would you please pray for me? I see that hand. You can put it back down. Thank you. Anybody else would say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved. Please, would you pray for me? I'm not sure about that point of my life. Anyone else? Very good. Believers, hey, here's a challenge for you. You raise your hand. You say you know you're saved. But you still live like you're not. You still live like there's still sins you need to be forgiven for. You still live with this guilt. You still live like God doesn't want anything to do with you. You still live like there's a barrier between you and God. The veil was rent in two when Jesus died on that cross. He gave you access to come to him anytime with boldness and confidence. He's made you holy. He's made you accepted. Not because you're worth it. 
Not because you're worthy. But because he's good and in his grace he did that for you. It's time for you as a believer to start living like you believe what Jesus said he did for you is true. How many of you would say, Pastor, today God has spoken to my heart. I've been living with guilt. I've been living with some things in my life that betray exactly what God said he's done for me on the cross. And today, I, as a believer, I just want to make a decision to believe what God said he's done for me is true. Even when I don't feel like it. Even when I don't feel worthy. I just want to live believing that what God said he did for me is true. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Pastor, I just want to live with it. Believers, I want you to lead the way in this invitation. You may need to come and just praise the Lord for what he's done in saving your soul. You may need to come and say, Lord, you saved me, but today I'm going to make a decision to stop living with all of this guilt and all of these things that, uh, that you've already forgiven me for, and I want to believe that what you said you did for me is true. Maybe you need to come and talk to him about that, believer. I want you to lead the way. And there was one individual who raised their hand, not sure that you're saved. I'm going to pray for you in a minute. And I want to challenge you, as others come forward to pray during this invitation, I want you to step out of your seat as well. And up here at the front, there's going to be a gentleman ready to pray with you. If you would like to come and talk to him about how you can know your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven, hey, today would be a great time for you to make that decision. Lord, we come before you during this time and thank you for how you've worked in our hearts as you talk to us about this wonderful truth from Hebrews 10. I pray now you work with power in the invitation. And Lord, I pray for the one who raised their hand, not sure they're saved. Give them the courage to follow the prompting of your spirit to come and make the decision to trust you as their Savior today. And for those believers who raised their hand, Lord, need to put their faith in what you've done for them. And just, Lord, live like it's true. Live believing what you've done for them. I pray that you give them the courage to respond now to this invitation as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. I want you all to stand with me with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Right now as the music begins to play, if God's speaking to your heart, I want to invite you to come. You might want to kneel on your seat. You might not be comfortable coming and praying in front of everyone else. But I want to invite you to come to this altar. God will give you the courage to do so if you'd like to do so. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you look to that hand and you need to trust Jesus as your Savior, would you come? All we want to tell someone take a Bible and show you how you can know Jesus today. As you can walk out of this place knowing your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. We want to show you how from the Bible. Would you come? speak to your heart. Maybe you'd like to respond. Maybe you need to pray with someone, need a counselor, and come to the front. We'll be happy to help you with that. Maybe you don't want to walk for it. If you'd like someone to come pray with you, can you raise your hand right there where you're at? We'll have someone come talk with you. Someone come pray with you. If you're in need of prayer today, we want to help you. Just lift your hand right where you're at. Scripture. If you've had more questions and you want to talk to someone about how you can know Christ as your Savior, uh, I hope that you'll uh, shake my hand after the service is over. I'll be at the back door. And just tell me you'd like to talk to someone about knowing Jesus as your Savior. I'd be happy to introduce you to somebody who can sit down and take a Bible and help you understand that. Uh, you can walk out of this place 
and knowing what the Bible has to say about how you can truly be saved. Amen. And uh, that would be the best decision you'll ever make in your Amen. life. That's right. And so I hope that you'll do that um, if God is speaking to your heart about that today. I want to invite you to our service tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be opening God's Word again. It'll be a different service than this morning. And if you can join us for that this evening, uh, we'd love to see you here at 6 o'clock. Got some special things in store. And then don't forget to get your kids registered for Vacation Bible School. Uh, we're looking forward to having kids in here again tomorrow evening and Tuesday evening and Wednesday. And uh, the things that God has in store for us there. Please pray for us this week uh, that God will bless uh, Vacation Bible School uh, this week. And so as we prepare to be dismissed, um, oh, I have to announce this because I keep forgetting to announce this. Um, a lot of you have been asking when the due date is going to be uh, for our baby. And it looks like we're going to be having a baby uh, around Valentine's Day. So I already decided we're going to call him Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let him pray for a boy, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> You pray for me, all right? I'm going to have a whole church praying to that thing. <laughs> uh, well, let's go ahead and, and pray and be dismissed, and I hope you'll get around and say hi to, to one another on your way out here. And as we go to dismiss, uh, I'm going to ask for Brother uh, Gene Patton if uh, you'll lift up your voice for us and dismiss us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're again thankful that you have come and saved our souls. We're thankful, Lord, that you guide us and lead us daily. Too, that's why I'm...